welcome friends to yet another episode of my video presentation on the topic of heroes in real life last time i presented uh, bob anderson this time i am presenting uh, professor tom gilb thomas steven gilb he is famously known for his uh, gilb's laws five laws very interesting laws which i am presenting later on in this uh, video and a personal interview with him uh, professor gilb had uh, many achievements to his credit and uh, he was a consultant he worked with ibm he taught and he has um, migrated from usa to um, england and then norway and he settled there Uh, and his personal achievement which is uh, to be emulated by most young people of this generation is he, he was married to his wife for the last 60 years they married in 61 and uh, pre- which was preceded by a two year courtship and dating and that is 62 years amazing they had four kids who are all working well so friends i present you professor tom gilbert thomas steven gilb the famous gilb's laws computers are unreliable but humans are even more unreliable that the source of every error which is blamed on the computer you will find at least two human errors including the error of blaming it on the computer second law any system which depends on human reliability is unreliable third undetectable errors are infinite in variety in contrast to detectable errors which by definition are limited fourth law investment in reliability will increase until it exceeds the probable cost of errors or until someone insists on getting some useful work done fifth law a system tends to grow in terms of complexity rather than of simplification until the resulting unreliability becomes intolerable sixth law the only difference between the fool and the criminal who attacks systems is that the fool attacks unpredictably and on a broader front Here is the photograph of the Gilbs on the right side as you can guess is Tom Gilb and his wife when they were younger and happier and here is the photograph of Tom Gilb in the present day almost recently taken photograph here is the photograph of the kids of the Gilbs then they were very young very old photo and here is the photograph of his grandchildren as you can see here is a photograph of the family of gilb with all his sons and their spouses and their grandkids some of them not all are present but most are there Here is the photograph of the Gill family at a re- reunion and their dinner. Professor Gill had experimented with religion and here is a guru from India, the city Bangalore, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, who is spiritual guru for the Gill family or Tom Gill at least. From the back rooms of large corporations to the present day scenario of all pervasive usage, can you tell us your perspective as a participant, a driver, a propeller, an influencer and frontline observer of the evolution of information technology, sir? Okay, well, when I started 1958, I joined IBM. It was a punched card service bureau, and many of the machines were from uh, the 1930s. Uh, and there were no electronic computers in, uh, in the country at that time. 
even though they they were other places. So I, 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 I in a way, I started in the 1920s and 30s, <laughs> but in fact, it was 1958. Uh, very quickly, we began to get some electronic computers, and uh, the punch cards disappeared. The magnetic tapes appeared. And then within a very few years, we had some magnetic disks, which had um, 20 megabytes of space and things like that uh, for a whole insurance company. Uh, and uh, then uh, I think at some point early 60s, I thought, well, it's uh, flattened out the curve. That's the end of the development. But of course, the greatest development was still yet to come by far and is still going on with great revolution. So it's very difficult for educational systems and people working to keep up with the pace. Uh, by the time you master something like a programming language, it's out of date. Uh, by the time you master something like a way of handling databases, it's out of date. Yes, um, so at an early stage, I figured this out that the pace of change was incredibly fast. Uh, every two or three years, everything was changing. So I decided to try to learn things that would not go out of date. Things like uh, basic concepts, basic measures, and basic principles. And uh, those are the ones, in fact, I've uh, put in my books and things like that. So maybe that's enough comment on the first question. Ah, yes, sir. Yes. And uh, you authored many influential books on information technology. Can you please enlighten us about those books, sir? Okay. Now, uh, I've published uh, more than 11 books and I've written another 16, which I only published on the wow. internet informally. Wow. Yeah, in fact, uh, I, strange, I have a strange hobby in the summers now. I, uh, the last three summer, uh, holidays at my summer cabin, I've written five new books where a book is, you know, two, three hundred pages. And most of these I um, um, uh, give away for free for the moment. Uh, so uh, if you like, it's a very long paper, but it's a book because it's uh, it, it is two or three hundred pages. Um, anyway, uh, influential books um, in 1976. So then I am uh, 36 years old and I've been uh, in the computer business, um, let's see, uh, 58, 76, 29 years. Yes, uh, I, I published a book called Software Metrics, first in, in uh, Scandinavia and then a US edition in 77. So that was my first influential book because it even became a university topic, you know, how to quantify um, software uh, ideas like security and availability and reliability. Something hardware people had been doing, but software people didn't quantify much more than the number of bugs they had uh, and uh, what else, <laughs> the <laughs> number of hours they spent. But uh, software people were still today are not very good at quantifying essential things like the usability or the security or the privacy of their system. So I'm still fighting the battle to get people to um, uh, quantify critical factors. Um, so if we skip, uh, here's a, a book I wrote in 1988, Principles of of software engineering management. Okay. Yes, sir. It's a very and influential book. Yes, this can still be purchased as a, a after all these years as a um, uh, paper book, and and I really don't have a good digital copy of it. That's the way things were. Uh, but uh, and I was just reading this book recently myself, and I'm I'm quite amazed all the things I managed to squeeze into the book. Really, but, <laughs> uh, but I was uh, writing uh, a lot about what we today call agile. Yes, and uh, I, I even have a whole history, a chapter there on the uh, deeper perspectives on 
evolutionary delivery, which is what I called agile. Yes, sir. Yes, As sir. Evolutionary means sprint by sprint delivery. Yes, sir. And uh, I had been uh, doing agile from about 1960. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I did a project uh, for a client and uh, I delivered it in 20 incremental steps of change and wow, value. Wow, wonderful, sir. So, yeah, so I, 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 but we didn't call it agile. We, in fact, we didn't call it anything. We just, uh, nobody Easy. taught me any different. And I thought it was a good idea to do a little bit at a time and check yes, it sir. out, make sure it worked yeah. and do something useful, especially since all the computers and machines we had were new. I mean, yes, neither sir. I nor even IBM who supplied them knew much about the computers or the software at all. Yes, so uh, and then, of course, the application was the customer's secret. So a lot of unknowns and complexity. So I thought, well, take one little step at a time and make sure it works. If it works, build on it and go on. And in fact, in the uh, software metrics book, uh, I found um, on the, the end of the book, page 217, a quotation that complex systems are best done in small steps which deliver value to the customers. And if they fail, they can be reversed. And I'm very proud of that because I described what I would call the, the best idea of Agile is this step-by-step -step measurable value. And uh, if the step fails, well, you can revert. That was 1976 in the software metrics book that I mentioned earlier. So in fact, I was describing uh, what I call Agile as it should be. Because the agile that many people teach, uh, Scrum and Safe, it is not based on delivering value. It's based on delivering code, yes, which sir. people hope has some value, but that's not the same thing. So I think most of agile out there today has failed to live up to these early ideals of delivering real measurable value to uh, stakeholders. Anyway, with the um, Principles of Software Engineering Management book, um, I, I learned uh, from my friends who, have, uh, who wrote the Agile Manifesto, people like Kent Beck and Jeff Sutherland and Mike Cohn, they, they all quote um, uh, this book, Principles of Software Engineering uh, Management. Uh, Mike Cohn even called his company the the uh, Mountain Goat Company after one of the Mountain Goat principles in the book, and he yes. proudly tells me that. And uh, But they all say they were inspired to go for Agile after having read my book. So that allows me to say, well, I was the grandfather, even if they are the fathers of the popular, and in my opinion, not quite good, as good as it could be, Agile method. The, uh, the, the thing they mainly took from me was the idea of doing things in incremental small steps, but they failed to pick up the idea of delivering value measurably to stakeholders. They really just used it as a device for doing the work of coding and programming. And most of the people who signed the Agile Manifesto, even today, people like Kent Beck, are programmers in their heart, and they say so very clearly. They're not systems engineers trying to build complex systems for stakeholders, they really just love their coding. So not surprising then that the Agile they taught and teach is very code-centric. Skipping to the last uh, book in 2005, so I'm only giving you examples of three out of the 11 books, but uh, I published uh, Competitive Engineering, and I have pretty good digital copies of that, which I give away for free. So if anybody can't, uh, you can go to my website, gilb.com, and you'll find a way to get a free copy of competitive engineering digitally. And you can buy still a paper copy. It has sold over 20,000 copies. Wow. Um, and, uh, it, it, but it, it, it really is an attempt to build, um, uh, uh, build a systems engineering method for IT systems and for other kinds of systems, not only IT. So, um, so uh, in other words, the methods I have today, I realize are engineering more than craftsmanship. That is, they're based on calculations and measurement and numbers and logic, not just 
coding the way we usually do in a language we usually know, which I would call soft crafting. Uh, so uh, so I, uh, I've long had uh, an engineering paradigm because we all know that when systems become very complex, when we move from log cabins to skyscrapers, you have to have architecture and engineering. No longer can you have a simple craftsperson, however good they are, uh, at coding or woodworking or plumbing or something like that. Uh, so I've always been fighting to get the engineering uh, methods into building of large IT systems. Still, it's a fight every day. We're still not there. I sometimes think that it's uh, uh, another 50 years and people will realize they have to do engineering. Uh, and, and unfortunately, most of the people who are in the business, they are not engineers by uh, academic education. They are really just uh, coders and uh, they program and the, even the architects are have very little quantification and systematic work. So I wrote a new book last uh, this summer 2020 called Systems Engineering Architecture and I'm currently doing a series of 10 one hour sessions for the uh, Oslo Software Architecture Meetup Group. Uh, using one chapter of that book, Software Engineering Architecture, uh, every day. Any, anybody can get a free copy of that. If you go to my LinkedIn website, uh, you'll, you'll find how to get a free copy of uh, the uh, uh, Ar Software Engineering Architecture book. And I recommend that for all the enterprise architects out there. Very happy to give you a, a free book there. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the uh, actual one hour twice a week sessions, well, they're actually sort of overfilled and filled up. But in theory, uh, we actually have one person from India who's there. Uh, uh, and, and so you can get in if you get in early enough and sign up early enough. Otherwise, they are videoed and they will be available for free on video. So you, again, news of that you'll find on my um, LinkedIn or Twitter websites. So. Uh, yeah, so competitive engineering um, is the definition, the formal definition of my planning language called Planguage, which is uh, an engineering way of stating, for example, qualities and constraints and advanced requirements and doing the um, uh, looking at the designs and architecture quantitatively before making decisions about prioritization. So I have developed for 50 years a whole language which is uh, enables you to think about any problems. I use these for all kinds of things. Uh, I, in, as a consultant, I've used them for building airplanes at, at Boeing, for example, 25 different projects, nothing to do with IT. So the, the language works on any kind of system, although maybe 80% of what I do is some form of uh, IT. But uh, so that's the competitive engineering book, book. And then I haven't published anything in paper since then. Oh, by the way, there is an Indian edition, very, very cheap, if it's not sold out, of competitive engineering. So uh, yes, my Indian friends, I think it's very, very cheap. So <laughs> um, and, and, and the, uh, the American edition is ridiculously expensive, like 40, 50, 60 dollars, I forget. <laughs> Okay, so all my other books since then, uh, I have uh, uh, really not published except on the internet almost informally. Uh, a lot of it I do free, some I just charge a, a minor uh, fee. My, my son has a theory, if you don't charge people and you give it away free, free they won't respect it. So we <laughs> charge it just to fool people into thinking they're, they're getting paying for something. But uh, me, I would love to give everything away free to everybody and on my on my website guild.com there is a great deal of free slides free papers free books free videos uh to uh, so uh, go to guild.com and and download all the free stuff that should satisfy most people's needs I, I would love to think that some of the listeners would like to study these methods and can use these free books and things like that and they're very welcome to steal my ideas and get rich on them. Anybody <laughs> wants. Thank you, sir. You know, 
one of the sentences you just said uh, systems engineering mm-hmm. and uh, programming even uh, yes. i to find that uh, most people are either programmers but they, there's a big lack of system engineering thinking in uh, it field uh, do you also subscribe to that view yes of course uh, you know, I, i think the thing is that there is no present culture that says that ic it systems must be done in an engineering fashion um many years ago somebody uh, uh coined the term for a nato science council uh it was, oh, it was very early 1968 and 69 uh, uh uh conference software engineering so yeah. you would think that engineering was an old idea for software i talked to professor uh, edsker dykstra who was one of the chairmen and he said well there was no engineering but we knew that if we used the word engineering then nato would give us free funds for the conference and they got fooled <laughs> so it was a joke to fool people into giving money from the start and real <laughs> engineering has never been a serious part of the culture i i really feel like i'm the one who's always fighting for getting the engineering into software and uh, i'm succeeding but uh, i'm not surprisingly i mainly am succeeding in engineering companies so my best clients are who do my methods uh, are like intel boeing ericsson of sweden uh hewlett packard you see th- these are all engineering companies so they immediately understand what i'm doing and feel it fits in with their way of doing software but the moment i go to for example a bank which has large it systems that's not an engineering culture that's a finance culture yes and uh so they they sort of sometimes they get interested and they pay me a lot of money and they play with it and then it dies out again they just they don't have they don't have a um, a group of people who understand engineering fundamentally and yes. are attracted by the usefulness of my ideas in software yes, so sir. this will uh, what it will what but here's the thing that worries me sort of number one worry you can google anytime you like it projects failure rates yes, okay yes. and you will get millions of hits but on the first page you'll find that there are plenty of independent investigations that for decade after decade it projects have a 40 to 50% total failure rate yes sir in it addition to which they have what they call challenge systems in other words the system works but it was 10 times more expensive than it should have been or the system was done on time but it has very low qualities that everybody is unhappy with those are challenge another for, so something like 80 to 95% of all it projects are some degree of failure and very few are complete success so our business is is and has been in deep trouble and agile as taught by the agile manifesto has certainly not solved the problem it's actually gotten a little bit better but it hasn't solved the problem so we're uh, the business is still looking for a solution to why are things total failure imagine if heart surgery and you have 100 patients and 50 of them die <laughs> and 40 more of them are disabled afterwards and only five <laughs> have a good heart we would think that was terrible heart surgery yes, it's, sir. it's, yes, it's sir. much better yes, than sir. that but yes, this sir. is how we are incredibly bad and nobody is doing anything about it what we're doing is we're suffering it and we're tolerating it yes okay sir. by yes, by the way some of the very big uh, failure projects i've yes. uh, had work with are uh, there are indian companies Uh, and i won't name them but they are involved and they are led by their silly clients in maybe england or america yes, uh, who give them very bad requirements and then they do mm-hmm. the best they can but it uh, they they don't really correct the error of their clients they just yes, program and code and get paid for it and and uh, nobody takes any responsibility yes, so sir. wouldn't it be wonderful if the indian community would help the their clients to succeed in their systems in spite of the fact that the their clients aren't very smart about this that's yes, one sir. of my dreams 
<laughs> yes. You know, you have already mentioned about the P language, app language. Uh, can yes. you, you have developed it for software capturing software requirements and software design. Can you elaborate it a bit? Okay. Um, now, uh, again, uh, at my website, and um, uh, again, look on the web, other things. Uh, in fact, the, the nicest way to do it, if you Google my name, Tom Gilb, and TEDx, you'll find a lovely little 17-minute TED talk, which explains this language in very nice, simple terms. And we use the example of having a requirement for love, and then we ask the question, how do you quantify love as a requirement for a system? Because some people say, you can't do that. It's not quantifiable. It's just a wonderful quality. But uh, so I would recommend that. But uh, let me focus. The key or the foundation of my method is the idea that all the qualities, in other words, reliability, usability, security, these kinds of things, all the qualities have quantified requirements. We don't just say it shall be very secure, it shall be wonderfully user friendly. We quantify these concepts uh, so that they can be, they are clear and intelligible. That's the main thing. And then later we can measure that we are achieving or have achieved them. That's the, that's the foundation of engineering. It's also a scientific foundation to quantify a hypothesis and then test and see if you got it. So, um, so the key, the simp in simple terms, the key foundational idea is that we quantify all the qualities and most people do not do that at all. They don't know how and they're in denial. They say it can't be done, it's soft. And they go off and uh, write some code to do the functional requirements, what the system does. And then they have extremely <laughs> bad qualities for the system and people are very unhappy and they say, well, you know, computers are and IT is so complex. So that's the way <laughs> it is. And people just suffer. It. Yeah. yeah, So that's the key idea. Now, the moment you have quantified your quality, then you can do one other very important thing. You can uh, uh, quantify how good any design or strategy or architecture is. You quantify how good, good, good it is along the same numeric scale that you've used for your qualities. And uh, in other words, we can reason about our architecture or design better because we have quantified how good that architecture has to be for the security or usability or anything else. Um, so, uh, so that's the, in other words, we have quantification of the design. We start with quantification of the um, uh, uh, requirements and then we, we follow up by being able to quantify the design. And then we, a third part is we can then, having implemented the design, we can quantify the degree of incremental progress towards our goals. We can manage the projects. So these are the basic ideas in the planning language or language that you can quantify all the multiple dimensions of quality as well as the multiple dimensions of cost things like technical debt can be quantified and uh, and and uh, you get much better control over the satisfaction of the system uh, for your stakeholders okay that's uh, the simple explanation of the whole thing and uh, <laughs> I have many books papers slides and videos which go into some detail about this for anybody who's interested but you can just start at the guild.com website Thank you, sir. You know, uh, the name of Gilby is uh, popular and associated with your five popular uh, laws that you propounded. What made you propound those five laws? <laughs> Are there <laughs> any more, more laws that laws. I don't know of? <laughs> okay, we're talking about those. You know, in uh, very early when I was, uh, couldn't have been more than 30 years old. By the way, I'm 80 years old today. Uh, from uh, 24th of December. So I'm a really old man. And I've, in other <laughs> words, I've been in the business uh, 62 years. I started wow. at 18 years old. Yeah. Wow. So I, in fact, I'm probably the, the oldest living active. <laughs> I'm still active with my clients worldwide. 
but uh, uh, although I try to be retired and read and have fun and things like that, but I still have clients that approach me and insist on, and I, I want to help them so I can't say no. So I, yes, I, I, I do that. But uh, uh, the law. So uh, at the age of about 30, uh, I was just thinking, uh, uh, I wrote a paper called the laws of, uh, ultimately called the laws of unreliability in a magazine, very the most popular magazine then called Datamation. And you can find this on the web if you look and on my own website, the laws of unreliability. Uh, actually, originally I called it laws of reliability, but the publisher thought it was much more fun to call it the laws of unreliability. <laughs> They're a bit more dramatic, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but the first law, and actually 10 laws there, not just three, but sometimes only three are quoted or only one. But the first law is, uh, computers are unreliable, but people are even more unreliable. <laughs> True. <laughs> and uh, now this has survived. Uh, there was a time where every day I could check Twitter and somebody was quoting my law, sometimes yes. with my name on it, Guild's Law, and sometimes without my name on it, just, you know, <laughs> pretending like. Uh, one one time I found somebody on Twitter that quoted my law without uh, giving my name. Of course, I was uh, glad that the information was getting out there, but yeah. I was a little bit um, uh, unhappy <laughs> that they hadn't credited me. <laughs> so I wrote them. A, I wrote them a little note back, and I said, "Do you realize that is my copyrighted law from date of nineteen fifty nine? The email I got back said, "Oh my God! I thought you were dead." <laughs> That was a long time ago. <laughs> so I fully intend to keep on going if I can for another 20 or 30 years. I wish uh, that we'll you see. go on, sir, that you would go on. That is my cherished wish. Yeah, but uh, I hedge my bets. So this is why I write five books every summer uh, so that uh, when I'm finally gone, uh, my friends have my ideas in writing digitally free and uh, hopefully the ideas will become more mainstream and popular. Uh, right now, it's only for the elite 5%, you know, who are very serious in multinational corporations, you know, like Intel, Hewlett Packard, who are also engineering corporations. They are the ones who in the long term take and have taken my ideas most seriously. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, I, I should add one more thing. Now, yes, sir. you see this book here. Yes. It says principles yes, sir. of software engineering management. Yes, now, sir. somebody, uh, uh, there are 10 chapters in the book, and yes, in sir. every chapter, there are 10 principles. Now, principles are really just these laws. Law is a little bit cheeky and arrogant, you know. If you're a little yeah. bit more humble, you know, yes, you're not Newton with the you know, laws of motion and thermodynamics. So uh, mm -hmm. that was just a dramatization. So almost all these ideas these simple ideas, I call them principles. Yes, sir. And uh, everybody will quickly notice that all my books, my new ones, my old ones, all my papers, all my talks, I have at least 10 principles to explain everything. Wonderful. Paper and risk has 10 principles about risk. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a paper on architecture has 10 principles about architecture. So in this book, a yes, lo sir. lot of academic books, you know, it says yes. principles of, yes, but you know, they don't have any principles, but I actually <laughs> have 122 principles in wow. the book. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and I'm quite proud of them. The, the, now think about principle. It's a short summary yes, and sir. gives advice for what you should do. Yes. Sir. And uh, hopefully it's very good advice and easy to remember. And if you're lucky, the advice will last through many technical generations yes, of sir. change you know yes, in other sir. words it should be a, a good principle would be a, an eternal truth you know good for another hundred or thousand years so every time i write down a principle i ask myself was this principle something that could have functioned in egyptian times yes sir. say four thousand years ago building pyramids yes sir. and i say yes of course it could okay did it function for my 62 years through changing technology? Of course it did. Do I believe, do I foresee that it could function until further notice? I can't imagine it will ever change. Yes, okay, then I'll put it in my book. I'll hand it to my, my friends 
and they won't get obsolete by learning my principles, you know, some old ones that have gone out of style. But there's one principle in particular, it's fun to uh, quote. Uh, I, uh, let's see if I can actually make it legible here. Uh, can you see a principle called the uh, Einstein's principle? Yes, sir. Einstein's uh, principle I could see. Yeah. Well, I'll, 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 I'll read it. It says here, Einstein's oversimplification principle. And it says here, things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I remember this. That is a this. brilliant principle. And I was told yes. that Albert Einstein said that. But years later, a young, uh, young man at a conference I was at in Texas said, Tom, uh, I see you have quoted this Albert Einstein principle. Can you tell me where you got that from, the source? Yes. And I said, well, somebody told me, everybody knows. And he <laughs> said, well, you know what? Uh, I was very interested in this and I cannot find the source. And then uh, uh, he, um, he said, actually, there's a book by Albert Einstein uh, called God Doesn't Roll Dice or something like that. So we went drove to the bookshop and I read Albert Einstein's whole book during the conference and I said it isn't in there like you said it would be. So he then said well in my youth I was at a university where there's a professor who knew Einstein. I'll call him up and ask if he knows. And he called up the professor and he said Einstein didn't write it in any of his famous works. He gave it in an interview in Newsweek magazine May the 17th um, and I forget the year, probably 1952. Actually, I found things in Time magazine related to, uh, which is one of the last interviews given by Einstein. So I have wow. that in the interview. Wow. But, but wow. I didn't find this quote. So we had a hobby, a gang of us, and we actually found a talk he held at Cambridge about 1931, where he came very close. He always had this sympathy that things should be simplified, right? E is equal to mc squared is nice and simple. So he always had this sympathy, but nobody could actually catch him saying exactly that quote. I even had a professor, friend of mine in family, uh, Professor Lawrence Stark at Berkeley, who was a big fan of Einstein. So I went and said, Larry, you will tell me where Einstein said this. And he said, yes, I have a hundred books about Einstein. And you know, he couldn't find it. <laughs> Finally, I got a hold of um, a lady called uh, Alice Caliprish, who is the editor of the book on Einstein's quotations. And she had access to all of his papers at Princeton. And she told me, Tom, many people think he said that, but I, have, I cannot find it at all. So it's in the chapter on my book on things that people said Einstein said, but we can't prove it. So... <laughs> Then I was reading a book called a Society of Mind by Marvin Minsky, very famous MIT professor. And this is about 10 years ago. And he, he quoted this same thing. Things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And so I looked him up on the Internet and he was still alive and he had an email address. So I wrote him an email. Professor Minsky, uh, uh, you're from... Uh, Princeton, uh, and, and you, um, you quoted this in your book, but do you have a source? And I have an email. I still have it today. I could show it to anybody who wants to see it. An email back from Marvin Minsky. He's dead now. And uh, he said, uh, Tom, uh, I, when I landed in Jerusalem to hold a lecture, and they're big fans of Einstein there. They wanted to make him president of Israel. Yes, uh, they asked me first thing off the plane, uh, Professor Minsky, do you have a source for your quotation from Einstein? And he said, no, everybody knows he said that. And they said, well, we are big fans and we don't know. And so, and, and, and now it turns out, Professor Minsky then said to me, Tom, I used to go for long walks with Einstein on the Princeton campus. And you know what? I think he said something similar to that, but because his uh, English language was so like mixed up with German accent, I cannot be sure he said exactly that. <laughs> and so the conclusion is 
that you know who said things should be as simple as possible, but no simpler? <laughs> Tom Gill. Tom Gill. Yes, his sir. 1988 <laughs> book. I always <laughs> wished I had said something so brilliant, and now nobody can beat me. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. You deserve that. <laughs> but that is a story about a principle. <laughs> and it's a beautiful principle, isn't it? Things should be. Yes, sir. Very, if you very go beautiful. below that how simple they should be, you will yes. reduce the quality and increase the cost. So yes. there has to be a certain minimum level of yes. design and things to yes. get what you want out of a system. It's a wonderful principle. I wish yes. uh, I say I wish I used to say I wish I had said it, but you know what? I did put it in my book, 1988. Yes, sir. That is the source. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Gilb, we come to know of you because of the Gilb's loss. And yes. uh, we do not really know much about you. Can you tell us about your career, your illustrious career? Okay. Now, uh, I, I, I met my wife, who's a Norwegian, when she was studying English in London when and I was 17. Uh, 17, yeah. They, uh, that's when I joined IBM. I was still 17. Yes, I was. Wow. I said 18 before, yeah. So I just turned 17. And a lovely lady, and she still is, she's in the next room, so she can't hear what I'm saying. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I decided, grab that lady, you'll have only one chance at a most fantastic person in the world. So uh, I actually, uh, being very precocious, proposed marriage to her, got engaged, and I traveled with her when she went back to Norway, up to Oslo, where she lived. And uh, two years later, three years later, we got married, and three years later, we had four children. So, uh, and Norway is a wonderful place. Uh, don't tell anybody. We would get. To, <laughs> we couldn't take the entire Indian population in the little Norway. <laughs> we're we're only five and a half million people. But yes, if you look yes. up on the internet, quality of life survey, yes, sir. Norway yes. tends to be number one. Yes, if sir. you look up. True. If you look up happiness quotient from United Nations, uh, uh, Norway tends to be number one. Yes, if you sir. look up wealth, because we yes, happen sir. to have all the North Sea oil, Norway mm -hmm. is up there with the Arab states like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Yes, so we're rich and happy. It's, yes, a, it's a really great place to be with a very great democracy. Yeah, also very great democracy, which works very well, very well yes, balanced. Sir. So, yes, so anyway, so I ended up in what was in a poor country nobody wanted to come to, but uh, they happily took me in. Nobody wanted to come to Norway. You know, everybody says it's cold and icy. And uh, to make a long story short, I, and I had to get a job to stay here. So I, but I knew that, uh, I knew about computers. My parents had taken me in California, where I was born, to the Rand Corporation, where a friend of theirs worked, and showed me a modern computer with blinking lights. And I was already an amateur radio operator from when I was uh, 10 years old, K6 GUV, and uh, I like technology and playing around with it. So, uh, and I, IBM had um, a United Nations flag as their flag, and I was kind of idealistic after the Second World War, uh, you know, peace. And, and they, they had, um, uh, IBM had a slogan, world peace through world trade and the United Nations flag. So I, I thought, good, it's an idealistic company and it's in Norway, and it has these fun little things to play around with called computers. So I knocked on their door one day, two weeks. Uh, I was uh, in, in Norway for two weeks. And I said, if you got some kind of a job, any kind of a job, I'm, I haven't even finished my um, advanced level uh, 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 certificates from London where I'd been studying. Uh, so I didn't have a lot to show. I certainly hadn't uh, entered or finished university. Uh, but uh, the, um, they gave me a test. The test was, how long have you been in Norway? About two weeks. Can you speak any Norwegian yet? Yeah, I've tried to learn. Okay, he gave me the front page of the newspaper to translate, and I translated it because I could do that. And he said, smart fellow, start tomorrow. So that's how <laughs> I got a job. And ev Great. everybody else Great. had to wait another 10, 10 years yeah. finishing university education, but I got in. Uh, very lucky. Okay, <laughs> so um, yeah, so I had a, a wonderful job. Yeah, so after about two years, I left IBM to work with some IBM customers for several years, installing things, and then I went back to IBM 
to run their schooling system. I became chief instructor. So I was a total of five years in IBM. But outside of that, I've always been a freelance consultant running my own company internationally until my son joined me um, about 30 years ago, Kai Gilb. You'll find him at gilb.com. Yes, and uh, so, uh, and I didn't ever, I decided I never wanted to start a company and grow it because I didn't want to become, a, uh, I don't know, a, a babysitter for a lot of immature young people. I wanted to be free. <laughs> I wanted to be free to do what I wanted to do and say what I wanted to say. Yeah. I wanted my freedom above all. So I've, I have retained my freedom professionally to criticize Agile, for example. <laughs> I'll, I'll criticize any method I think is bad for people and I'll give yes. my reasons and anybody can criticize me back. Yes. But um, uh, the moment you're a member of a company, you don't dare criticize because it may hurt your company and your colleagues. So, yes, uh, and I, I learned that in an unfortunate way at one, you know. So I, I, I love the freedom to be a critic of bad methods. Wonderful, sir. Wonderful. You know, you are an inspiring personality. I was inspired by you. And, uh, but uh, who were you inspired by, especially in information technology and in life generally? Yeah. I'm sure you have your uh, role models and okay. inspirers. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, my mother was, uh, you know, parents are often inspiring. So my mother was very inspiring. Uh, she would uh, always take me to uh, classical music and opera and plays. She was herself a playwright and an actress. So she she inspired me to, to um, like good culture. I can say that much. Um, uh, my father was an inventor and he had over 100 U.S. patents. Wow. He wrote a little book about creativity. And I recently have written a book called Innovative Creativity. Go to my website. So he was very creative, but he turned his creation into patents and, and actually a large industry. And he became multi-millionaire uh, because of his patents. So, well, those were two inspiring people in my early life. Um, Later, uh, I, I, um, I, what I found was that um, because I had very strange, you know, I, I started work at IBM. Uh, I would say like people like uh, Watts, uh, Watsons of IBM, who I met, or, or he was the chairman of IBM. I met him quite early here in, uh, uh, in Norway. I was inspired by the way he ran his company. And uh, IBM was a very inspiring ethical organization to work for. So I was inspired by the way they did business and, and uh, the quality of their products was always first class. Um, later, uh, as a young man, I was inspired by people like uh, Tyler de Chardin and uh, Albert Einstein, no, not Albert Einstein, um, what is my, uh, uh, Albert uh, Schweitzer, sorry, Schweitzer, the, the, the Swiss philosopher. And uh, the, where the philosophy is reverence for life and respect for life, things like that. Uh, uh, as we I went into uh, my early years, I, uh, I worked, uh, I took 10 years of night school at university while doing my career. So I got to study philosophy and uh, some of the philosophers like Rene Descartes became a hero of mine for his ability to decompose uh, complex ideas into simpler ideas, which I still uh, use very heavily in my methods, the decomposition idea. Uh, so I was inspired, uh, also inspired by people like uh, Emil Durkheim, because I studied sociology uh, to do serious analysis and quantification of soft disciplines like sociology. Um, so, uh, but, so, so there were uh, la later, uh, in 1983, so we're skipping a bit, right, but only 30 years, uh, I met Dr. W. Edwards Deming and went oh. on a one-week course uh, where yes, this sir. book was only a manuscript out of the crisis. Oh. And I, uh, So I, I was inspired by him because uh, he, unlike many others, he was not out there to make money by an idea, which many of the scrum people, they're just trying to make money no matter how bad their product is, and it's, it's yeah. very awful. But Dem Deming wanted to spread good, healthy ideas to people for the, to make the world a better place. So he yes, devoted sir. his life to that. And yes, uh, so, so he inspired me to try to do the same thing. 
to, to devote my life to spreading good ideas to make the world a better place and not worry so much if I got very rich, like some of my friends in the agile business have undoubtedly become very rich, but I don't <laughs> think they are very, some of them I know are not very proud of their product. But when I ask them, why are you teaching this silly stuff when you actually think my ideas are better? And they said, Tom, I have to earn a lot of money because I had a divorce from my wife or I have owed a lot of money and I have to earn the money no matter what. <laughs> yeah, literally, they, they, they don't believe what they're selling, but they need the money and they're yes, Americans. Yes. And in America, <laughs> well, earning is, think, think Trump, you know, earning a lot of money is your prestige, not having good, good ideas. You know, Trump never said, you know, I'm, I'm a wise person and I will share my wisdom to make America great again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. But, but, yes, but sir. By, by, by Mr. President Biden is closer to my ideal. He really does care and he's really using his accumulated wisdom for many years to try to make America a really better place. And we will see that work he and Kamala Harris are going to do. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. but uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, sir, you know, we sir, know a little about your professional life, but uh, nobody ever knows about your personal life. Now I am amazed to uh, learn that uh, you and your wife are married for 63 years. In well, these we got days married, of, uh, yeah, no, we got married 1961, but we got engaged. You see, in the old days, you got engaged for a few years before you got married. Yeah, but uh, we got engaged, in fact, in uh, 58. So it was, th uh, yeah, three years until we got married. Yes, and sir. then so another three years, we we have uh, four sons. Uh, I actually uh, happen to have a picture. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, I think this is not exactly on our wedding day, but I, it's 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 something like that. There's can Tom you please uh, email it to mother. me, sir? Can you please email it to me so that I will include it in my uh, total yes. final video? I can I'd like to love to that. have it. I, put it and then we have we got the four uh, 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 lovely boys. We just uh, spent part of the evening with our oldest boy this evening uh, and uh, so all the boys live around us and uh, we have some grandchildren we're very happy with and things like that so yeah so we've had a very good uh, 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 oh not without its arguments uh, even today you know but uh, <laughs> uh, it's like my which hats television off to program you. are we going to look at kind of arguments my hats off to both of you sir <laughs> I also understand that you have a unique philosophy on life and that you experimented with religion. Can you tell us anything about your philosophy? Yes, well, let's see. Uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, well, to, uh, there are two, two things. Um, uh, uh, I, I was actually brought up, my, my mother took me to different churches, different religions. And just to, enter, no matter, and she wouldn't even ever tell me what she believed, but she just wanted to expose me to different faiths and help me have respect for the different faiths. So that was interesting. Uh, finally, we ended up in a thing called a Unitarian Church, uh, which means is a, a free thinking church uh, in England, America, uh, probably nothing in, in India, but you're allowed to believe anything you want, but you're allowed to work and learn and uh, do seva, serve the human com community and be good, nice people. And a lot of people join Unitarian Church because they're like a mixed marriage of two different religions. So it sort of solves that problem. And, and today I actually attended the Unitarian Church that I go to in London, uh, uh, in Hampstead, uh, by uh, Internet. And we have done so the entire year where we get a church service and then we meet people and talk with them afterwards. But uh, so so one part of my uh, re re religion is above all respect for people and, you know, try to be good to the world. That's primary idea. And uh, secondary ideas keep on studying and learning and maybe trying to get closer to the truth of what is what. 
um, but uh, for um, over, um, uh, I have to get another picture, which you're probably going to ask me to send, but I'll go. Please, please, I'd yeah, love to have it. Yeah. And okay. I'd like to so, include it in the video. Yeah, so here's another picture. Let's see. Uh, sorry about the back and forth. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this man. Yeah, yeah, Ra Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Yes, well, there's yes. a name there. Yeah. So this is Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Uh, yeah. This is from 1996. Yes, sir. So we were uh, uh, early um, uh, adherents of Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Uh, uh, we actually know him quite well. Because, wow. uh, you know, when you when I go to India and I'm with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, there are usually one million other people at yeah. the same meeting, including lots of heads of state. But yes. when he comes to Norway, yeah. my wife or I is typically his driver. We drive yeah. him all around the country. We yeah. spend hours in the car talking with each other, driving around. <laughs> and so we have, uh, uh, we have gotten to know each other quite well. Uh, whenever, uh, whenever we, uh, I bump into him, like at a conference, and I walk up to him, he tells the people he is talking to. He said, "Ah, here comes Tom. He is my English teacher." <laughs> why? Why am I his English teacher? Because I was the only one who dared correct his English. Nobody else would dare correct the guru's English. Right. But I had, I just wanted to be nice and help him, and he appreciated the help. His English is very, very good, but it's a typical Indian English, you yes, might say. Yes, sir. That is true. That is true. Yeah, yeah he's not lived, uh, you know, lived for 10 years in England like Gandhi or somebody like that. Yes. So, uh, but, uh, so, so, so we are, we consider ourselves to be adherents of Sri Sri Ravi Shankar and uh, the art of living, as we call it in English to this yeah. day. And we've been many, many times to the ashram in uh, uh, India. In fact, yes, my third son, Kai, had a marriage ceremony uh, done by uh, 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 Ravi Shankar at his ashram and his sister uh, officiated it. And I am in Indian costume. My wife is in Indian costume. We have a picture of that, too, by can the way. You, can you email it to me? Re remind me. Remind me. <laughs> sure, sir. Because, yeah. And I remember I went from this uh, wedding ceremony in the, uh, uh, and uh, I went back to a computer conference I was going to in India in, in my full Indian white costume. And wow. of course, I'm a very tall guy, but everybody at the conference had to have a picture with me and say, <laughs> you look like Indian prince. <laughs> true. <And I> did. <laughs> true, true. Yes. So we are, anyway, very uh, much into the... I, I also have been president of Art of Living Norway and for many years at the request of Ravi Shankar. And, uh, we, we, you know, he, he has very wonderful I ideas. It's very similar in principle to our Unitarian Church. You know, mm -hmm. he's not a fanatic, you must believe in anything, but yeah. he does give you really good ideas. Yeah. Um, the idea I like all the best is when, when he says, you know, Tom, we are all, each individual is part of what is called God. Yeah. You are God. You are God. You are, I thought, me? God? Oh, somebody <laughs> Somebody tried to tell me I was just an ordinary human being, and now uh, this wonderful guru tells me I'm part of God. I like that yeah. idea. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. I try to be as godlike as I can in my actions, at least amongst my professional friends. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, uh, you have already answered my the 10th question, how are you engaged that you are still consulting, you are helping. Is there any other thing that you are doing besides uh, consulting? And writing well, books every uh, summer? Yeah, I, that's right. I, so I'm writing about five books. Uh, I've written 16 books in the last three summers. So and I plan to write another five this summer. Let's see what happens. Like I want to write one book on stakeholders to give an example. I have a list of ideas and then I'm going to do them one at a time incrementally uh, and see what happens. Uh, so I, 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 yeah, I write books. I do write uh, papers and slides and hold talks. So uh, quite a lot of them. Um, 
Uh, I, uh, this year, of course, I've done quite a lot of courses and talks over the internet to like British Computer Society. I've done about eight different talks, some of them um, two to four hours trying to almost replace courses. And these are freely available on the internet. Uh, at, and I usually publish everything I do at my uh, LinkedIn site or, or on Twitter. So I do a lot of that. Uh, I, I have another new hobby, for example, uh, just before this meeting, I uh, um, joined a group. It's, it's called it's got an uh, it's called 52 Living Ideas. And if you if you write 52 living ideas dot com, anybody can find them. It's a, it was originally a physical meetup in New York City where there is there's actually an Indian man who's leading it, uh, Shrikant. And uh, he is uh, gathers about 40 people and they examine uh, deep literature like from uh, uh, Jung or uh, uh, Akoff or somebody like that, f famous thinkers, and they talk about it and analyze it and get experts to present on it. So I very often uh, go and uh, listen in. Uh, so. Um, uh, because it stimulates me with ideas I never would get otherwise. It's sort of a, uh, a really a university of a kind. So I, I do that. Spend a, 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 in fact, I spend about mm, 15 hours per weekend doing that. Uh, no, sorry, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> Seven and a half hours <laughs> per weekend. Yeah, and then. Um, uh, well, normally we would spend a lot of time with our children and grandchildren, but of course, COVID makes that difficult, not totally impossible, but uh, we have to be very careful. We are waiting for our flu shots. Okay. And okay. Since, since we're over 80 years old, we're going to get them very soon, but we haven't gotten them yet. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. So I, I actually spend, uh, also, I've always spent a lot of time reading like uh, average 35 books per year. I know this because wow. I log them. I can wow. tell you which 35. Sometimes I only write read 20 books because I've written five books the same year yeah. and that consumes some of the time I would have used to read. Yeah. But uh, so but that's a good recipe. Read 20 to 35 books a year and write five books a year. Uh, <laughs> that's great. That's great. That's great. Yeah. very inspiring. I, I also watch a lot of television, but I'm I, I love to watch the history channels. Oh, okay. and the science channels. Very okay. interesting. And uh, I watch a lot of CNN news. Okay, very okay. interested what's happening with the United States because I'm both a Norwegian and American citizen at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can understand. Professor Gilb, you know, it has been a pleasure and a privilege talking to you and uh, uh, eliciting your views on uh, life and things in general. But you know, you Thank have you. led a very um, inspiring life. You have done something. You came into the world and uh, impacted it in your own way. And there are many young people uh, uh, in the world who look up to guidance and they don't get that guidance uh, from people like you directly. They do not have access or they do not uh, know how to even access. So this interview will go to people and it can be shared because it is free and it is uh, going to be on social networks. So if you yeah. can give some sort of a message to them, how to do with the, what to okay. do with their life, um, how to come up, know, how to you know, make an impact. Yeah, Steve Jobs had a wonderful saying many people know, be curious. So I am, still very curious how the world works, how society works, how politics works, how science works, how how engineering works. And there's uh, we have this wonderful explosion of knowledge on the Internet where the poorest person now has access to far more than an academic had at a university library just 20 years ago. Yes, so uh, so every Everybody has access to uh, knowledge, to go for the knowledge. Now, uh, there's a, I, I give some advice there. There, are, and it's related to my principles that are always true. There are two kinds of knowledge. That which will be powerful and useful today and for 100 years. 
This is what I collect. This is what I try to disseminate. There's also a lot of knowledge which is temporal. It's very hot today, very uh, like a, a new programming language somebody just invented or something like that. But it's going to go out of fashion and it will be of no value to you. So it's not worth so much investing so much time to learn to master such things. So try to master things that will help you for the rest of your professional life. If you don't know what they are, try some of my books because I'm filling the books with exactly those things, I hope, and I think. OK, so in other words, I this is like classical knowledge or eternal knowledge. That's where you need to invest your time learning. And sometimes it takes 10,000 hours or many years to master uh, a discipline. So you, you can't have something goes out of style in one year when it takes five years to master uh, the, the discipline. That's silly. So I, I learned that very early and I'm very happy I made that, that investment. So as an old man, I have the tools to take the newest technologies such as artificial intelligence. And, and uh, now, for example, I'm quantifying all the qualities of artificial intelligence for the professors all over the world. Uh, those papers are available on my website, by the way. Thank you, Professor uh, Gilb. It has been very illuminating speaking to you. And I, I am sure the listeners and the viewers will benefit a lot from that. Thank you, sir.